Hello and welcome to the Essential Adventure Sport Podcast, where our aim is to shed some light on the world of adventure sports, be that top tips and best practice for coaches, leaders or guides, inspiring expeditions, or just a chat with one of the many interesting people who work and play in the outdoors. We really welcome interactions and discussions, so if you have an idea of a subject you'd like covering, or you'd like to contribute to the show itself, then please drop us a message. It's time to sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Essential Adventure Sport Podcast. This week we're joined by Paul Smith of Rock and Water Adventures. Why don't you start by giving us a bit of background on yourself, Paul, and how you're involved in adventure sports. Hi guys. Um, yeah, so I first uh, properly got involved in adventure sports when I went to university. Um, started with the um, basically discovering rock climbing through the indoor walls, actually, back here, back at Warwick Uni. Um where I was living in the student halls, it was about 100 metres to the climbing wall, 150 metres to the student union, 300 metres to where my lectures should have been. Um, so it was interesting to see that I sort of ended up in, uh, uh, not, not, in the, not in my lectures as often as I should have done, perhaps. Um, but that's, that's where I discovered, uh, discovered climbing. I'd, I'd been in the outdoors a little bit before that, camping, walking, family holidays in North Wales, that sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until then that I, I properly sort of got the bug of going climbing um that process led me to become a climbing instructor through through the indoor walls and through the university club so i got quite heavily involved in instructing as opposed to coaching quite early on um and through that process of becoming climbing instructor and enjoying that process i ended up uh, then moving to north wales and did a pgc at bangor with tim jepson um outdoor ed and mathematics so that then started the process of me having to get in a boat which i was not so keen on at the start um having been you know identifying myself as a, an out and out climber at that point um finished pgc enjoyed boating a bit went and did uh, my NQT year, started um, working in a school in Staffordshire, um, had the opportunity to go boating and climbing and doing all that sort of stuff, as well as my uh, my, my main job, which was teaching maths at that point. Um, so that was, that was quite a handy sort of role. At the same time as doing that, I was working my way through my mountain training awards. So I got my mountaineering instructor uh, quite early on within that process and started walking towards my uh, my paddle sport coaching because I was enjoying what I was doing with that. Um, there were some really nice, interesting parts. I remember doing my coaching processes course and I felt I learned more about teaching in those two days than I did during some of my PGC lectures which was quite an interesting thing that I'd certainly took a lot back to the classroom, but also translated that across to my, my climbing um, and my climbing coaching at that point. So it started to evolve, um, which is not too dissimilar from some of the other conversations that people have had on the podcast over the last bits, isn't it? Taking the bits that they learned from paddle sports coaching and taking it into the other adventure sports. Um and yeah, so, so that sort of evolved. And through my teaching career, I, I ended up spending 13 years teaching. And my last seven uh, years was actually as a curriculum leader for outdoor learning uh, across uh, both recreational side of things. So DAV and taking people climbing and boating, but also embedding outdoor learning in uh, mainstream curriculum lessons. So uh, maths, English, science, you name it, languages, orienteering with like, orienteering and languages go together quite nicely it, who'd have thought um but yeah it was it was that sort of process um so yeah so that was me getting involved into the outdoors and through the teaching side that helped me evolve how i delivered as a coach in a whole range of adventure sports and it's not just sort of climbing that i'm involved with and mountaineering it's uh it's boating it's mountain biking it's caving occasionally maybe now and again if i want a bit of an adventure because it's definitely a different adventure um so yeah a whole host of stuff yeah that's brilliant thanks a lot for that paul 
Um, just picking up on something you said there, you said um, where my lectures should have been. I'm sure your lectures were there, and I think you're the one that should have been there. <laughs> I think you're probably right, but I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. It doesn't matter now anyway. It was over 20 years ago. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't matter. Um, so this week we're going we're gonna to delve into um, practice and task design, and it kind of builds on nicely from the conversation we had with Todd a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if, if you guys at home haven't listened to that one, I'd suggest going and checking it out because it does have um, – a lot of progressions on from from that episode so in that we we chatted to todd um about the idea of practice and the fact that it can mean different things to different people um, and i guess it depends where you're looking at it from whether you're looking at it from a coach or a, a student or just a personal performance perspective so what, what does what does practice mean to you then paul um, well a bit a bit like todd it's it's really varied depending on which aspect we're coming from on it uh, often with our um, clients that we're working with, it, it comes down to a lot of what they want and what they need. If, you know, Dan, Dan mentioned before in, in the podcast you did with him, the sort of uh, sort of side of things to do with uh, whether we're exploring something, whether we're embedding a task, whether we're uh, trying to excel in that task, or whether we're just simply there to enjoy that task, the practice is going to be different depending on each of those elements. So in adventure sports, we'll often find ourselves in a guiding context where they just want to enjoy it. So we just need to give them the minimum amount of skills to go and enjoy that journey, that experience. So practice at that point might just be a quick bit of, you're going to need this later today. Have a go at it now. And then we might do a little bit further on before we get committed properly, go, here's another go at this skill. <laughs> Let's build on that a little bit more. And then finally, when they get to the point of needing it, they've already started to understand a little bit about what they're doing and how they're going to manage it. Whereas if you go to the other end and you've got people who are you know, fully on about excelling, it means that we end up having to really start thinking about how we get sort of adaptive expertise from them, which means we have to really, really vary the situations we go into, the environments they go into, and mass and practice at that end becomes absolutely massive in, in how we have to structure it. It becomes a lot trickier to do to, for a certain extent uh, to get that range of experiences. It's a bit like um, Rob talked about in the last podcast about uh, – you know, those people that were really, really good at the terrain who then went to Austria and suddenly were really, really out of their depth. And it wasn't necessarily because they hadn't practiced the right things. It was probably more to do with the environment and the fact the change of environment was too big for them. So we're often thinking about how we change tasks and how we change the environment in both, well, in all four of those cases, whether that's it to enjoy, explore, embed, or excel. Yeah, that makes, to that makes total sense to me, really, that, um, that it, it just depends, doesn't it? It depends on what your reason for wanting to practice is. So that guiding example is a good one that maybe we're just preparing them for the activity rather than for kind of lifelong participation or performance, wherever it might be. Um, and all three of us provide coach education programs, and at the start of most of them, we end up talking about wants versus needs. And you just mentioned it in that little um, answer you gave there. So for those who've not heard of this before, or maybe not heard of it in a coaching context before, what is it we mean by wants versus needs? So often clients have particular wants, whether that is a task uh, orientation, whether that's a specific route, you know, some sort of goal along the way, they will, you know, that, that, that's, that's that driving force, but often they miss out knowing what the little steps are to achieve that want. And so that's normally what we refer to as their needs. Um, and they can be really, you know, really not understand what the component parts are. So as the coach, it's that negotiation of going, well, you want to do, be able to do X. Well, these are the steps you're probably going to need to do in order to get to that next point. Um, you know, prime example, I used to get paddle sport in uh, coaching. I'm not a very good play boater by any means, but people will go, I want to learn to cartwheel. It's like, great. Can you hold your kayak on an edge? No. 
okay, that's where we're going to start. And so getting them to, you know, negotiating with them probably is the, probably the best phrase of going, well, I need you to be able to get good at this part and then we can work on the next part. And that's how that sort of fits together with how we design learning tasks, learning episodes, whatever you want to frame them. It's us as coaches that we need to know what the component parts are of whatever those wants are. Then they can be really broad. It could be a technical hard skill. It could be, actually, I want to climb my first E2. What what do I need to do to get to that point? Um, and they they don't know that journey to do that. So you're going to have to guide them through that journey. Um, so it's a really broad topic, wants versus needs, which is one that we definitely see candidates struggle at coach education courses, whether that's at climbing coach education courses or paddle sports coach education courses. Um, often down to the technical understanding of the coach and their point in development as well. Um, I certainly look back at my paddle sport coaching and I potentially hadn't done enough boating or understood what I did boating to be able to coach effectively at the, at the start. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly the case where we do see people trying to jump through hoops just that little bit too quickly without consolidating at a level. And their technical understanding of, is often lacking because of because of that, which then help doesn't help them when it comes to helping clients with wants and needs. So maybe they have a they have a they have their own little wants and needs question that need to ask themselves, don't they? As as potential new as coaches. coaches. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have any particular strategies when you meet clients for establishing wants and needs in relation to their day? Um, one of the key bits is, you know, having a chat to them beforehand. <laughs> you know, simply, what do you want to do? What's motivating you today? You know, what, why are you here? What, why have you employed me? Um, all those sort of things are quite important questions uh, to get to the bottom of. Then the other side of it is actually what they say does it actually marry up with the performance that we see so there's an element of needing to see some sort of performance um this is you know the way i sort of talk about this is is diagnostic tasks it's that running something you know it's it's either running a little drop in on a, on a bike if they're you know wanting mountain biking coaching and it's like well actually can can you do a, a one foot drop off there's no point wanting to know about how to do a three foot one if you can't do a one foot one in control and other elements to it same same for paddle sports so i'd imagine it's the same on the sea you know i want to do this big crossing but they don't actually understand what it is they're going to let themselves in for so actually some sort of diagnostic at the start of the day or the start of that week long or that even longer term coaching episodes that you have with them um can can be quite important how do, how do you manage it nick do you work a lot in in advanced water environments so obviously the the idea of sampling their ability in in those environments might be too big a step so do you have a process that you go through to build up to that yeah i, I mean first i i agree with and endorse paul's comments um about the conversation that we have with our clients um both before uh the day in question and certainly at the start of the day where we're trying to figure out their motivations um since you've asked me a specific question about the working environments in which i'm most commonly finding myself these days um it's it's frequently the case that i have clients that want to paddle in more challenging conditions on the sea um, but that means different things to different people some people want to surf bigger waves or or make better moves on those waves and some people aren't driven by that. They, they simply want to paddle with more confidence in that area. And from a distance, the two can look a little similar. But the reality is that they're rather different objectives. So I like to try to dive into um, the, yeah, the motivations that drive people to stretch their comfort zones and precisely what, what that is. Um, the point that Paul just made about... Um, the distinction between a one foot and a three foot drop on a mountain bike, both of which I would find quite challenging. Um, I try to find progressive experiences uh, in any coaching day. And frequently my working environment permits me to do that in that if we're heading down towards an area that's 
going to offer a particular level of challenge. We can find places along the way that provide stepping stones towards that, that greater challenge that uh, represents their wants for the day. And that gives me the chance to address a few needs as I go along. They might be technical uh, elements. They might be tactical decisions relating to reading the water. And it might be psychological stuff to do with the way they respond to find themselves out there. So, yeah, for me, it's the conversation and then progressive experiences. Do you think that links uh, that links nicely to that whole environment and task and just turning things up just ever so slightly and just increasing their experience over time, um, which which makes it much better is probably a much more meaningful way of practicing to a certain extent as well, instead of going one foot drop, six foot drop. Ooh, that's a big, big difference, but actually a one foot drop to a one and a half foot drop for most people would go, Oh, I'll have a go at that. Um, I, th- I think it's, I think there are times when it, it's easy to make an assumption about what people want, even though you've had a conversation with them, you then, you start to plan in your head or you start to think about what's going to happen. And then when you have a, a second conversation, maybe immediately before you engage in the activity, then all of a sudden something that they didn't say before they then say, and it, it changes everything. So I, I, I have an example this week when I've been working at, been running um, a, a rock skills course or so mountain training rock skills course. And when I spoke to uh, the client they had this week, he, he's got a lot of experience. He's done a lot of climbing, probably indoor climbing, but he's done a lot of climbing. And actually looking at the syllabus, he's, he's done everything that would be done in that course already. And I thought, oh, right, okay, then this is, you know, you, this is, this is going to be an easy day in some respects. And, um, and we had the conversation and he then said, yeah, no, I've done all these. I've got these experiences. Let's go and have a day and let's enjoy it. And then we got there and he said, right. I want you to go through everything as if it was a beginner. Um, so start everything. Forget what I know. Go through everything because I don't know if what I know is right. So even though yeah. I've got experiences, I don't know if they're the appropriate experiences. So I went with a plan in my head about how the day was going to look, obviously sticking to, sticking to the award. But then um, just that one thing that he said in the car park as we were putting our bags on, I went, oh, right, that's, <laughs> that's a bit different to what I thought. Um, yeah. And it was it was good in a way, but then it also highlighted that that actually what he needed wasn't really all this input, but what he really wanted was all this input. So it's a bit of a shift around the other way compared to what sometimes we're used to with it being what they want is actually more than what they need. Yeah, so it's it's confirmation, isn't it? It's confirming. That's part of the thing that we're doing a lot of the time, um, even with this uh, enjoy, embed, excel, explore stuff often they're wanting confirmation that what they're currently doing is the right thing and the fact that they might have self-taught themselves to get to that point but they understand that they're potentially missing a key link because the youtube video doesn't give them that key link or that little blog post off the internet gives them a little bit of information but doesn't necessarily explain the understandings of why someone's decided to make that quote or that post or whatever it is because it's it's not it's not spelling it out to them so they can't make their own decision you know going back to lol's discussion with you guys on the first podcast you know what we're actually doing really is teaching people to make decisions and they often do know certain amounts of information but there's also a lot of stuff they don't know and our job is to sort of blend the two together of taking what they already know what they don't know and trying to overlap it. Now in them, what they don't know, there might be some stuff that they never need to know. So a great example would be uh, climbing and climbing protection would be if a, a client turns up with their rack and they've not got a tricam on it, I'm not going to teach them about tricams because they don't need to know about it. But conversely, if they do turn up with a tricam and they place it and they place it badly, then I'm going to have to educate them on how to use tricams because they've got one. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to overlap those two sort of broad areas. Um, but for that to actually happen, we need to look at what, what they definitely know, 
how they implement what they know, which is that, that diagnostic thing that we were talking about, and then and then make a decision on what we need to teach them or what we need to work on or what we need to reinforce or what needs to be new. But we can't do that if we've not seen them operate. And it's a real common one that I see at coach education assessments. They make assumptions that turn out to be wrong and go down the wrong path with people. They teach them stuff that they already know because they haven't asked the question about, well, what do you know? They haven't given them five, 10 minutes to paddle around in their in their boat or to do a couple of easy warm up climbs and to see what they're like beforehand. And then they go off in the wrong tangent. Now, that might not also be bad at a paddle sport instructor level or a you know climbing wall instructor level or indoor climbing assistant level but it's a real big thing when you get to development coach or performance coach in paddle sports um and pe people are surprised that they don't pass because they make actually what's what is a simple simple thing to do before they actually start coaching yeah you, you could also argue it's not only really simple it's it's kind of one of the most important things that they do isn't it because mm -hmm. that that sets that sets your use the phrase coaching episode that sets that episode up um because without that information and without that conversation then surely it's 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 just about you giving them stuff without giving them what they might need as a result of a conversation and there we are back to wants and needs <laughs> yeah it's it seems to me that frequently um a really useful thing that a coach can do um in adventure sport environments is to engage the student in decision making by giving them some choice and in a climbing environment that could be pick a route that would that would serve as a suitable warm-up for you pick a couple of short routes and we'll have a conversation about it and then we'll probably go and climb them or pick a river section that represents a good start to the day and once you've done that let's take a look at it and Pick some eddies for me that you think you'd like to make on your first run down. We do this a lot in um, specific areas on the sea where we frequently invite people to choose a route through that area that represents a suitable challenge to them. It tells us an awful lot um, that enables us to avoid the need to guess and make assumptions because now the client or the student is involved in designing their practice. And they end up motivated because of that. Yeah, there's nothing more demotivating than being told you're going to do something that you already think you can do well, and then not actually receiving any feedback on that at the end, other than, oh, yeah, you're quite good at that. Yes, yes. And the less we know our students, um, frequently it can be surprising in different ways, the choices that people make. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I find that very helpful in my working life to 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 get my students involved in in designing the session with me. <laughs> um, do you notice? I know when I deliver these um, these coach education courses or leadership courses that um, we we tend to talk about, or actually they tend to talk a lot about kind of technical skills and it tends to be a, a big focus on what do I do with the paddle? Where do I put this? What's the boat doing with this? Do you try and structure those, um, those initial activities in a way that give you multiple pieces of information? So Nick's just talked about decision-making there. Well, that, that would fall into that kind of tactical understanding, wouldn't it? So do you, do you, do you both purposely try and do stuff that gives you, um, lots of pieces of information that you then have to uh, decode i suppose to, yeah. to help with that with that initial task setting yeah there's there's obviously a time constraint a lot of the time to some of this stuff so in a climbing wall session it might only have an hour with them so it's got to be quite a quick diagnostic process unless you know them and be working with them for a period of time um whereas actually if you're working with them for a week on a five-day residential, for instance, you've you've got best part of the first half day to 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 actually do this, and then in your mind you think about it at the end of that first day and go, well, how am I going to, you know, map this out for them for the rest of the week? Um, so there is a, there is a time constraint. Um, I often, certainly with things like climbing, I, I'm more interested in the tactical decision making that they're doing rather than the technical skills. 
Um, you know, there, there, yes, there are some technical skills that they need to know, and people like technical skills because they're normally measurable. I.e., is this a bow rudder? <laughs> We've all seen guys, haven't we? Varying standards of what people consider to be a bow rudder. Um, they all look different, and some of them are effective, and some of them aren't. So if they're not effective, they're probably not the, an effective bow rudder. Whereas we can have a, uh, you know, an ineffective one, which is like, well, why are you even doing that? Um, there's still quite a lot of stuff within climbing walls where people are teaching, this is a rock over, this is how you do it. And they go through a process of, there you go, this is how you do a rock over. And then a surprise that the clients can't do a rock over because they can't see where the rock over is. They can't see that they need to shift their weight. They, do, they don't understand it because they've done it on one problem and they've learned that problem, but then can't apply it anywhere else. Whereas I'm more likely to go, well, which of the holds are you going to use? Which direction are you going to pull on them? What's your body going to be doing to allow you to do that more effectively? And asking those more of those questions, which is actually the tactical decision making. Focus on that route reading and they'll tell you very quickly that actually the best way of doing that is pulling the hold from this direction. My body is going to be facing left, which means my inside and outside edges on each foot are going to be doing this. And I'm going to initiate getting my center of mass over my left foot by pulling with my arm. Brilliant. <laughs> They're telling me what to do. And actually, they've effectively done a rock over, which is just standing on one foot to a degree. <laughs> so, so I've got some questions about that. Um, is that a purposeful thing from your point of view to, 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 to set an activity up where they're generating their own understanding of it? Or um, is that a byproduct? No, it's, it's set up that I want them to know their understanding and their decision-making process because I want them to be able to do it without me. You know, I'm not going to be there when they have to perform for real if it's competition based or if they're trying a route that's hard for them outside. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be that, you know, little guardian angel on their shoulder going, are you sure you want to go left? You know, or any other hints or tips. I'm setting them off. So I'm I'm not I'm not involved making myself redundant. You know, that's that that thing. Uh, Nick, you spoke about that the other day on on the other podcast um there's there's a time and a place for it but my overall aim is to make sure people don't need me i guess what you're doing there is and you've used the phrase a couple of times now you're you're designing a task aren't you you're going through a process of going right i'm gonna i'm gonna design a task which is gonna have whatever outcome that is that sounds maybe to people like, oh, design a task, that's a pretty simple thing. Um, and I often have conversations, I did it, I've, last two weekends I've been doing coach education and um, the, the topic of um, the coach standing there and or sitting in a boat or standing on the board or whatever it might be and looking like they're doing nothing and what the perception is to an outsider who's looking in compared to the outsider looking in on the coach that's giving it the waving arms and the shouting and doing all those things. And um, it, there were a couple of conversations that we had within the course that, that it started off with, well, I should be doing all the work because I'm the coach and they're employing me. And I said, well, if we, if we design the task effectively, actually you do a lot of the work, you do a lot of the thinking and to an outsider, maybe it looks like we're sat there, stood there, whatever it might be, not doing a lot. So, um, it does seem like a simple thing, but, but is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, what the outsider's not seeing is all the hours that I've spent having to learn how to do that thing myself, potentially. They put the time in to think about what the components are of that particular skill. Think about how I'm going to get those that information across to the, to the people that we're working with. That's all stuff that's happened in my case over the last 20, 25 years. So I can go with a very, very broad plan to start with of going, Oh, we need to do this, this, and this. And I already sort of know how it's going to fit together because I can just react on it from the reflections that I've done over the years. 
the problem we have with our novice coaches is they've not had that process of having a go at stuff and it not working. Yeah. Um, it's the reflections that are the important part. I, I, I talk about on coach education courses, particularly at Foundation Climbing Coach, that we're after some reflections on some sessions that they've done. We don't specify a number as such. I think they might have changed it now, but basically that 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 there is some reflections occurring. But those reflections normally end up being, I was awesome, the group got it all, I was amazing. And you know, you look and they've only got five reflections and they're all that same reflection. And they've only got, if you look in a logbook, 20 sessions of coaching. And I turn around and go, in all my years of teaching, 13 years in a classroom, you know, obviously on average, maybe 15 to 20 one hour lessons a week, I can count on one hand the number of out lessons that I would have reflected and gone, the group were amazing, I was amazing. Yeah, on one hand. So I know you're fibbing and you're fibbing to yourself. <laughs> and they sort of look at me and they're like, oh, and this is the point I normally pull out a, a, a card with an image on it and it's the, the Dunning-Kruger card. And so it's the whole uh, unskilled and unaware of how unskilled they are. Uh, and we, we sort of have that discussion at that point. It's like, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to miss stuff. You know, this is why working with a mentor is quite useful and all sorts of other elements to go with it that allows you to go, actually, I'm not so good at this. And then I also talk about with them, I go, you know, sometimes on the coach education courses, I run a bit of a session and I'll honestly turn around and I'll go, that's the first time I've ever done that. Yeah, I've just come up with a game or an activity or a coaching task. And I'll be honest with them and go, I've just come up with that. How did it work for you? Oh, oh, you, you like that bit, but not that bit. Brilliant. Can, I'll make a note of that and I'll scribble it on the side of the board and I'll go, well, from my point of view, the fact that you've told me that means that I won't try it that way around next time. I'll do it this way around next time. Do you think that would work differently? And they suddenly go, oh, yeah, yeah, it might do. And we go, OK, shall we try it? And sort of really highlight and try and role model the fact that you've got to try stuff and you've also got to be willing to get it wrong. Now, that comes down to a supportive environment where you're working, admittedly, or who you're working with. But, and also a certain amount of cocksureness, I suppose, is the, probably the best way of describing it. Uh, you, you've got you've to be quite happy that you can turn around and go, yeah, actually, it didn't work as I planned. I'm going to change it to this, this, and this next time. Now, going back to your sort of original comment about the, the people feeling like they should be saying more or standing there and being the center of attention effectively and being very coach centered. Um, certain sports are, lend themselves more naturally to that. Climbing's a great example where you've got people moving around very slowly and doing things and it's dead easy for you to stand there and tell people what to do. Um, and that looks great from the parent side of things on the side because they see you doing stuff. Um, and that's definitely been some feedback on coach courses for climbing where people are like, well, mommy who's dropped them off is seeing me not doing any work and so is questioning that with my boss but you're telling me that actually i should say less and ask them to do stuff and come up with tasks themselves to make them think themselves i'm like yeah that's what you've got to do and i talk about you know I'm, I'm paid for my actions that are the outcomes not for the amount of words that i say i'm supposed to to, to, to help with that specific example i guess um if the coaches are having some dialogue with the parents and, and involving them in the process and getting them to, to buy into it almost. And um, it means that they, I guess it would be easy for them to look on it and make those assumptions going back to that word again. But if they're part of it and they're aware of what's going on and there's been a conversation between them and the athlete and, and the parent will then, they know what's happening. So they probably feel a little bit more comfortable about, about what's going on and give them the, um, give them the freedom to, to ask you as the coach some questions and just yeah. checking in what's going on. And um, that'd be a nice way, wouldn't it? Of, of including them and reducing the, 
the conflict that could probably occur, I would imagine, in that environment? It's 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 probably to do with how those sessions are marketed more than anything else. <laughs> you know, are they nothing more than glorified childcare, which sometimes they are in climbing walks? Not always. <laughs> Before anyone tries to tries to do a hatchet job on me for that, but um, yes, yeah, so sometimes that it is. It is that it is glorified childcare, but other times it's actually specific coaching sessions. And it comes down to those relationships between the coach, the client, and when they're under 18, their parents. And if we're not including the parent in that process, then don't be surprised <laughs> if there are complaints or there are questions raised about whether you're working or not working in inverted commas, but it's, it's education, it's educating them. Um, we used to talk about it quite a lot within terms of risk management uh, about informed consent. You know, actually, if the informed consent part of, well, actually, we're doing this activity and it's risky, but it, this is what it's going to look like. This is what coaching looks like. That will help change the expectations of, of the parent in this case. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? What, 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 th what, um, you're thinking about task design still, Nick, what, what things do you find come easy to you? What challenges do you find when you're trying to think about how you're going to design tasks or practice sessions with the with the people that you work with? That's that's a big question, Matt. Um, I think you know me well enough to know that very little comes easy to me. <laughs> However, um, I have uh, a number of strategies that I find useful. And I mentioned one of them earlier in terms of involving the, the students in their decision making through identifying appropriate challenges. And um, I was reflecting on that um, while Paul was describing um, a similar situation a moment ago. And I frequently um, uh, get very interested in the uh, in the distinction between the students expectations and the actual outcome so if they've told me that they want to visit a number of different places in their boat and then come back to me and we usually agree that it will be a circuit and they will come back to me um, one of the early questions I'll ask them is to uh, reflect on what they just did and to tell me how closely aligned their expectations were with the reality of the outcome. Sometimes people say to me, yeah, I pretty much went where I intended to go and I did it in a way that wasn't a surprise to me. It's what I predicted before I set off. But, but equally often and probably more often, people identify in discussion um, some differences. They might have been a little bit surprised by the speed of the water. Or they might have intended to follow a particular route towards another area and something about their technical skills and the way they applied them meant that they they ended up following a different path that was a surprise and so in that situation um, I might have identified through observation um, some some uh, relevant and immediate changes we can work on uh, and whether I have or I haven't I'll typically invite my students to go and paddle the circuit again, observing what happened last time and to make some changes that they think would be would be suitable. We often discuss that so I can get an idea of what they think they're going to change and away they go again. And I suppose this is linking into uh, what Paul was describing a moment ago in terms of asking questions of your students and getting them to reflect on the options. Um, I find it buys me some time, lets me individualize a little bit because uh, people can remain active and I can take moments to talk with people to find out how they're, uh, how they're developing the, uh, uh, the circuit. Some people don't need much input from me. Some people want me to help them make their decisions. And I would say that's a, that's a, that's a strategy I use a lot in, in designing my practice within which within which we can get into technical skill development and we can get into tactics and so on and and the direction we go is going to depend on the interaction that I have with each student so each each time are you um I'll say starting again but that's not what I mean you're not going with a, a predetermined plan you're responding to what you're seeing and to the answers to the questions that you're receiving and um 
sometimes you don't know where it's going to go and it, you might think it's going to go in one direction, but actually because of what you've seen and what you've heard, it ends up going in an opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like yourselves, um, within the last week, I was out with a group of, uh, of, of clients exploring some coaching practice and this question arose the 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 question of uh, predetermined session structure and whether we're uh, following a trail of breadcrumbs to the, uh, to the to the to the to the end of the day and uh, the 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 specific example we were on a section of Anglesey coastline heading towards uh, an area that we knew would provide a certain level of challenge and on the way there was a there was a there was a, a, a slightly less challenging area that nevertheless created a little bit of fun in the waves and the currents. And we started exploring um, opportunities for structuring practice there. And the question came uh, how we would make a decision about whether to continue or to stay or to go back. And of course, it's, it, it returns to the type of activity we agree and organize with the students, the observations we're able to make, and how they're responding to progressively increasing challenge. So we, we wound up we wound up discussing observation skills and questioning in addition to the, 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 the structuring of the practice that we were, that we were experimenting with. And, and that's often one of those things as a good coach, you can jump on little things that you weren't even expecting to do because you haven't got a fixed plan in mind. Um, you know, some of the, some of the work that Sid was doing for, uh, was at Pl Plasi Brennan, but is now at British Canoeing was, was looking at the differences between the plans of an expert and somebody less experienced. I think, I think Dan spoke a bit more about that, if I remember correctly, on the podcast that he did with you. Yeah. Yeah. He talked yeah. about um, planning, having that kind of straw man plan and yeah. you know, going on from there. So I guess one of our biggest jobs as a coach then is to, notice stuff isn't it yeah it's to be be open to any sort of possibility and as soon as we go with that fixed plan or that you know that definite idea well that's when we start to not notice stuff because we're just driving driving along that road to a destination and and absolutely I, it's gone oh no no i was going to say i you know i work with with nick often enough to know that he's He's excellent at, at noticing an opportunity for something that you know, most people might look at and it just looks like a boring bit of something, you know, that they just would dismiss out of hand. But um, he notices, right, well, we can use that because that's, that's, that's going to generate either some discussion or that's going to highlight something or um, I can use that and bit of the environment to our advantage whereas some people might dismiss it as oh we need to get to the big stuff because that's where the that's where the action's at so that's where the the progress is going to be at that's where the the gold dust is but but going back to that idea of progression um it's about that information gathering constantly isn't it taking yeah. on board and trying to be be um be aware of it, but also be open to it as well, I guess. Yeah, and it links back again to the motivations, the goal setting, wants and needs, etc. I started work on Saturday morning with a pair of clients I'd never met before. They'd never met each other either. And pretty much the first sort of question I asked them was, uh, what, what's a successful day going to look like, guys? And it was thrown straight to them. They sort of were like, uh, uh, I don't know, I thought you were going to tell us what a successful day looked like. It's like no, no. You know, you you've come here not as a you know not as a novice. You've come here to uh, improve their sport climbing grades. You know, they had an aim of of, of wanting to work towards climbing um, higher higher graded routes in sort of the sixes, uh, low sevens, that sort of thing. And it's like, well, what, what's success look like for you? Yeah, and I, I've done the same thing. Where the question, the answer I've expected is, oh, I want to develop this or I want to do this or I want to be better at this and actually the answer that's come back is I just want to have a nice day I go oh right okay that's that's great I can uh I can I can manage that one but but um across the course of the day maybe what was their initial idea of I just want to have fun suddenly they start to go oh I, 
actually I quite like to have a go at that or it can it's allowed to change their plans allowed to change as well isn't it not just not just our plan uh, yeah again we we were talking about this the other day uh, on the beach at lunchtime and uh, there was a there was, there was a real world moment actually because uh, I was trying to be as flexible as I could be with the uh, the training program and I permitted myself to do that because we all agreed that um, it had been a while since we'd been paddling so we'd uh, we'd better be gentle to ourselves and, and me delivering a, uh, a textbook coach education course wasn't going to happen. Um, so at lunchtime, I turned to the group and I said, what would a great afternoon look like? Um, if you want to uh, get something out of the afternoon, then hopefully some learning is going to take place. But we're going to have to enjoy ourselves while we do it. So you tell me, what would a good afternoon look like? And when I've got clients and students, um, it's even easier to do that because we can we can focus entirely on what's going to be most appropriate and beneficial to them if i put myself in the in the shoes of a student for a moment if paul you took me climbing and i probably do need some help um if you asked me that question what would a good day look like for you well um i'd probably start by telling you what i didn't want to do and um if you found me a nice off width crack I might refuse to go up it because I just don't enjoy that type of climbing. A traditional thrutchy chimney. I'm not really going to want to do that either. Um, a nice ledgy slab where I've got to make some decisions about which way to go. And I've got to use careful footwork. Um, you'd find lots you could improve. And I'd probably enjoy that while I was doing it. So the conversation might take us to the point where you're helping me to choose a route at a crag that's going to meet those aims. And if you didn't ask me and you found me a, uh, a nice slippery off width crack, you might wonder why I wasn't having a great time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, the clients, clients know, don't they, what they want. They might not verbalize it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, for instance, if you'd booked onto a get better at off width cracks course, that you wouldn't be doing with me because I'm rubbish at them, um, <laughs> and 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 had and had that view, um, I'd be like, why are you here? Um, and it's an interesting one because when we're looking at things like task design in particular, we've got to take into account the skill level of the participant for that element, but also the challenge that they want to accept. So, for instance, if Nick, you turn around and said, actually, I'm not very good at jamming cracks or something like that, and he just happened to take you to Stanage. And I go, okay, he says he's not happy. You know, he doesn't like them. It's like, why don't you like them? And then you, you could then answer that for me, couldn't you? Go on. That would be another of my weaknesses. Um, although you might find me more highly motivated for that because I've had a couple of climbing trips into areas that I found very inspiring and I realized I needed those skills. So I can I can tap into my intrinsic motivations and say say hey the next time i go to that wonderful climbing area that route that i really couldn't get up because i i wasn't practicing that skill we could we could find a reason for me to develop that ability with you um uh, yeah so there we go um it's about motivations isn't it and, and as a sea kayak coach i'm frequently in patches of bumpy water because i live on anglesey it's frequently tide races and people usually book tide race courses so it would come as a surprise to me if on the first day uh, my students said they didn't really want to go there um, but of course there's different things you can do in that environment and some people just really want to surf waves other people want to move from rock to rock and link eddies and they take satisfaction from that some people want to just develop their route finding skills through that water. So even though we're all heading down to that that um, that environment, it's really important for me to find out where people's motivations lie and what kind of skills we're going to work on with them during the day. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's the other one because we can also throw some stuff in, stuff in by stealth as well. So, for instance, Nick with his not liking jamming crack, well, I could take you to, onto route on Stanage, and there's one move you've got to jam on a particular route, for instance. And if I know the environment really well or the routes really well, for instance, I could just sit there and I could go, 
he said he doesn't like jamming. Is it because he's rubbish at it or he doesn't want the challenge level or he's had a horrible experience? We could then potentially almost trick you into having to do a jam. And you might go, well, actually, that wasn't so bad after all. Can we do another route that's like that? Because, again, it's back to the clients not knowing what they don't know. They've just been told, you know, they might have just been told that actually jamming's really hard and it hurts and it's not very nice. And and you might be doing me a great service because maybe I um, I had a, a poor experience on a route that required those skills and perhaps I'd pick that route at just the wrong moment in my development. So I, I went away from the experience feeling that that type of climbing wasn't for me. That needn't necessarily be the case forever. You could uh, you could help me pass that barrier, couldn't you? Potentially. I might, I might reflect on the experience and realise that uh, I'd be, be missing out on all these amazing jamming routes if only I'd met you earlier. <laughs> like, like I said, it, it's not it's not jamming with me. <laughs> well, um, I, I suppose um, thinking about the working life I I, I have these days, I, I do often meet people whose confidence in specific areas is a consequence of experiences that they've had i mean our 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 first-hand concrete experiences tend to influence our self-confidence and i meet loads of people as i'm sure you do who perhaps are still struggling to overcome an an earlier negative experience and it's much harder to get past that point than with somebody who never had that barrier in the first place but it's still very achievable and um i'm now starting to to think that I should, I should go off with climbing. <laughs> it's been a very useful. Uh, it's been a very useful discussion, Paul. Thank you very much. Just uh, Paul, just get so, your in, get your invoice into him, and then you know you you can agree an amount. And um, I feel like I'm some sort of like you know, involved in some sort of counselling session here tonight. <laughs> well, you know, think thinking about you know what Nick's just said, I can think back to my early days. Uh, you know, as, as a young teen, possibly a little younger than that, the first time I got in a kayak, you know, I, I said that I didn't really discover adventure sports until I was at university, but I remember having a go in a kayak or kayaking before then. And my first experience was within the first 30 seconds of getting in the boat, they were expecting me to do a capsize drill, you know, and I was, I was in a boat and we're not, we're not talking like a modern cockpit design where there's loads of space and all the rest of it. We're talking probably something like a mirage or dancery type small cockpit where even though you're a small child, you're sitting there going, I'm not sure I can fit out, get out of this thing. It was hard enough getting in it. Um, And we see plenty of clients like that over the years. They're like, oh, kayaking's not for me or climbing's not for me because potentially whoever took them out that first time, I'm going to use the term instructor because it hopefully would have been an instructor and not a coach uh, at at that level, um, would be choosing things because that's what they do as normal as opposed to choosing what's right for the client. So it's more sausage factory delivery type stuff, you know, We only ever climb on these three routes at Stanage. We never go anywhere else. It doesn't matter whether the clients are better or worse. You know, I only ever do this on the pond. You know, it's an hour long session. That's all we've got to do. I'd like to think coach education and instructor education has come on a long way in the, you know, nearly 30 years since my first time I probably got in a boat. Um, You know, I'm I'm pretty happy with what I'm delivering now as a coach educator that's nowhere near that. But. Yeah, that's definitely definitely a, caused a problem for people over time. I, you know, I, I I reference that exact example quite a bit when I do, especially when I do paddle sport instructor courses and you know and introducing people to getting on the water. And I say, you know, there was a time when um, within the first few minutes you were doing a capsize drill and you were getting wet, and they go, well, what, why why would you do why would you do that? And I go, well, it's it's a really good question why would you do that but i wonder if we asked those people if we could flash back in time quickly and and watch someone have that experience and watch someone deliver that sort of um activity and we said why are you doing it they might well have a a, in their mind a justifiable reason for why they're doing it oh well it shows them how to get out you know and just in case because that's the danger them getting trapped in the kayak all those sort of things um 
but it'd be interesting then to ask some further questions about well what what impact do you reckon that's going to have on them going forward uh, what, what sort of day does that set you up for being cold and wet <laughs> at the very start of your day um you know it, it would be it would be an interesting um, set of questions to be asking wouldn't it cool yeah no it, it is and it's there's a lot of things that we might do as an instructor early on and it's normally and we I saw it with teachers as well I used to work with some trainee teachers and mentor them and they would copy their direct experience of how they were taught the coaches would do the same uh, in paddle sports and climbing you know however they were taught that's what they've based their model on and it comes down to that role modeling um and they don't reflect on whether that was actually appropriate or not there's plenty of stuff that we put into practice either you know in, in coaching across a whole a whole range of disciplines but they can be seen as unhelpful practices long term so the classic one you see in climbing for instance is the climber gets to the top of the wall it's a case of you have a forced conversation with the person who's belaying you. Have you got me? Yes, you have. Put both hands onto the rope. You're lowering them down. It's this conversation. That's actually put there by the instructor early on as a control mechanism to make sure people don't get dropped. Yeah, It's an understandable risk management process in the same way that potentially doing that capsize drill the first time you get in a boat to know they're going to get out of it again could be an appropriate risk management process. But unless it's removed at an appropriate time, it actually becomes a psychological crutch to them or, or not really a crutch, I suppose. It's more more of a, a, a hammer <laughs> and it stops them from being able to do things um, because actually as you are progressing as a climber, there's going to be a time when you might start to lead climb. Now, then if you lead climb, there's a strong chance you're going to fall. And if your only experience of getting onto the rope is when the rope is perfectly tight after a conversation with your B layer, and then you put both hands onto the rope, it's not reflective of what's going to happen when you fall off. So therefore, it is completely and utterly um, a different task, almost a different environment almost for them that causes great anxiety and actually becomes a performance blocker. But yet, if, and it, this again comes down to the technical understanding of the person to doing that session, they may be just copying the person that they learned from themselves and that is the rule at their place of work, which it could well be, um, but they don't have an, an idea of what's gonna happen when they leave them afterwards. They don't see that that's actually going to be a problem long term and so yeah on climbing wall instructor courses rock climbing instructor courses development instructor courses that sort of stuff it's all like okay what do you do when you get to the top oh we'll do this okay what's the problem with that long term hmm i don't know what do you mean and we go okay right let's lead some routes i want you to fall off without telling your b layer oh i can't do that right that's the problem yeah i i um i during lockdown i ended up getting involved in a lot of these kind of web-based chats and um uk sport ran quite a few and um a couple of other you know places doing them i ended up having a, a conversation about about coach education and some of the kind of the dangers that i reckon that there are for people who come onto coach education courses or leader courses or whatever it might be where there's there's someone in front of them who they make um either they make themselves the authority or the perceived to be the authority by the people on the course and um there's a real danger of them going away just going oh well matt did some demo sessions or whatever it might be and he did this this and this so that's great i'll take that and i'll go and do that that and that and i'll get the same result or i've seen nick do something i've seen paul do something so i'm going to take it and i'm going to go and repeat it um and I, i'm i had this exact conversation yesterday where it kept saying the same things when people were doing things the question is why are you doing it what's the point so when we're talking about use of constraints for example that's great and i'm, I'm we do loads of that love it um but if they're getting people to paddle with their eyes closed because they saw it on a course what's the what's the point of doing it if they've got if they can answer me and go well i think it's going to help develop a bit of feel and a bit of this bit of that whatever it might be well then I think it's a worthwhile thing doing. 
Um, so I wonder if going back to that capsize example, if we if we ask the question, why, what's the point? If we can't get a good enough answer for that, well then there's probably not a point, so it's probably not worth doing and we might have to think about doing something different. But it's very easy, I reckon, to get into a get into a habit of doing those things. And I've had someone on the course this weekend um, who openly admitted the reason for him coming on was because he qualified as a coach maybe 15 years ago. And he said, I think I do things an old school way. He says, and I'd like to see another way of doing things. And so he's really aware and he's reflected and he's open to, to seeing new ideas. And he said, you know what? I might not 100% stop doing what I'm doing, but what I'm doing seems to work because two of the other people were students from his or members of his canoe club who have only ever had his coaching and they were great. So it, it, we had to be really careful to go, well, you know, oh, he kept saying old school. Old school doesn't mean bad. I came yeah. through that route. Nick came through that route. You came yeah, through I did. that route. It, it's not a bad thing. Um, but I think it's really important that we're open to, to new ideas and to um, different methods of doing it. And I think one of the big problems, the big barriers to people doing that is often that we work in isolation, isn't it? So we work on our own and we don't get the opportunity to see other people do things so that sharing of ideas and seeing new things becomes a little bit more difficult to, to, to a certain point um you know that's the whole point of community to practice that sort of stuff um I'll, I'll talk briefly in a moment about a community practice that i'm involved with but the other side of it is that people don't want to make mistakes in front of um peers or, or or others particularly i find in a club environment more than anything else you know there's a certain element of uh, we do it like this here you know i've i've had plenty of people on coach education courses over the years that you know have come on a course and they've gone wow that's amazing you know the way you've got that across i'm gonna go and experiment with that and then i see them six months later and they go oh i wasn't allowed to i tried it once and i was told no, no, you, you don't do it like that here. You start with the capsize drill, for instance. Um, um, a good friend of mine, Tom Parker, talks a lot about uh, just because some no one died doesn't mean it was good. <laughs> you know, um, you know, just because you or the other way of looking at it is just because you survived doesn't mean it was the right choice. Or, you know, there's various different versions that he has, depending on how funny he's trying to be at that moment in time. <laughs> um, but the community practice that I'm involved with, uh, certainly over the last sort of five years of working out in the Alps in the summer. So it's normally spending two to four weeks out there boating, which sadly I missed this year um, due to, uh, well, not my control anyway. Um, but normally there's myself, Tom Parker, Chris Brain, uh, normally Andrew Bonney and a, and a couple of others. And we all tend to stay on the same campsite every evening we'll take it in turns to cook dinner and we'll sit down and we'll do because we're on the continent it has to be three courses and there has to be wine with every course and all that sort of stuff but generally the conversation always ends up about something about coaching and it might be that one of us has read a new article one of us has tried something different and we're talking about it and at the the end of that evening we sort of all go our separate ways and then go right tomorrow I'm going to try this with my clients and we come back the following evening and review it and instead of just one of us going out and having a go at doing something different or a different way or a new concept there's four or five of us that have all done the same thing that day in different ways and sometimes it's worked sometimes it's not worked and we have this non-judgmental conversation about it it's like hey guys i'm not trying that again in chateau q it's not gonna work yeah but somebody else will have tried that same new process or that new idea or potential new method somewhere else and have gone actually it worked really well there and the students were really engaged that process has with the delights of modern modern technology translated across to um translated across to you know internet forums and and groups and basically we've still now got a little group chat that we use 
most days that somebody sometimes it's rubbish jokes but you know other times it's like a serious point it's like have you has anyone tried this before or can we consider that um chris brain normally describes it as i'm not sure how i can record a month's worth of cpd in one go because that's the sort of weight that he puts on those discussions that we have um yeah it's absolutely brilliant and if more people can do that in terms of the community of practice and getting them together, then it works. Downside is that some of the NGBs have tried to do forced communities of practice, which don't work because for it to work, you've got to have sort of a mutual respect for everyone within the group. You've got to be willing to share equally um, and also be non-judgmental about it. Um, whereas if you're in a forced community of practice, that doesn't work. I've seen it being tried to happen in schools. It just doesn't work because people resent being in it then. So you've got to allow these things to naturally get together. You know, it sounds like you and Nick have got a community of practice together with the pair of you of this sharing of ideas and you bring other people in and out as, as, as you do. But that's the important bit, especially when we recognize that we work as individuals and on our own a lot took me a long time to realize that probably at least 10 years of working in the outdoors and instructing and delivering it was that importance of discovering that we needed to share ideas and just in case people go what what does the words community of practice mean basically we're just talking about a way of you interacting with other people who are doing the same sort of thing you know that could be within a club environment setting up a facebook page being on a whatsapp group chat um yeah. where other other messaging services are available um <laughs> but um yeah it's just some way of you interacting and sharing ideas sharing things that go well but also sharing things that don't go so well um, and what works for you might not work for me because we have a different style so yeah. um yeah communities of practice i think are, are a really important thing i like that point you made about for having, a, having an enforced one not that's not what it's about is it it's got to be um um you've got to buy into it and if you and if you're forced into doing it you're not buying into it so really it's not it's not a community of practice it's just a, a working group isn't it or a, a meeting you know i've certainly tried it with people at the end of courses and you've gone like guys you, you you've all had a shared experience you can all share information and on some courses, you know, you, you, you're you not setting up as such, but you sort of go, if people are happy, you know, we'll share email addresses, blah, blah, blah. And some people share loads and do loads and others don't because for whatever reasons, a whole host of reasons, but that's because we've tried to force it. I, I witnessed this weekend, they had three people from Bolton Canoe Club um, who were all chatting around, yeah, we can do this, we can do this. And then there was one guy who, who lives in Greater Manchester, not that far away from them, who... I was packing it up and doing my thing and he went over and said, Oh yeah, I don't live that far away from you. Would you mind if I came down on some of your club nights? And he, Oh yeah. And there was an exchange of, of details. And I thought, all right, great. There you go. Yeah. You, you've opted in, you've opted into that um, and done it on your own accord. And you're more likely to take part in it than if I go, you, you swap emails. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause day, internet dating it doesn't really yeah. work. Does it? Not at all. Um, but yeah, that's that's that that tricky part. I know we've obviously moved away from sort of uh, practice and uh, task design, but it's not it's not the end of the world, is it? Because it's all those important things that help us as coaches get better at doing this thing. And all it needs is in your community of practice somebody to go. I tried X today. That might just be the the trigger to get you to try a your version of X next week when you're out on the water. And you don't, the other side with the community of practice is you don't have to be a member of just one. You could be a multiple member of multiple different groups. You know, I think, I think I'm probably in about five or six communities of practice that we all share different things. And some of those people are the same in the, in the, in those groups. Some of them are very different. You know, we, we do it as, as technical advisors. We do it as mountain training coach providers we do it as a group of us that have got sort of a shared interest in developing coaching within other areas as well. It's, 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 it's a really important thing. Mm, I agree. Totally agree. We feel quite lucky because we get to do this on a regular basis where we get to hear other people from people that we might not normally interact with. And um, it's great to kind of share those ideas. And it, it often involves us finishing these recordings and we have a chat about 
the things that I've just been spoken about. So, um, yeah, I think the idea of doing all this stuff is amazing. So if you're not doing it, oh, well, I can't say if you're not doing it, do it. Cause then that's forcing you, isn't it? So <laughs> you know, if you're not doing, if you're not, if, yeah, if you're not, if you're, if you're not doing it, think about being involved in it somehow. Um, yeah. All right, great. Well, let's let's swing us back because we're, we're we're approaching our our kind of end of our time, aren't we? So, um, I, I've got a couple of questions that um, actually relate to some stuff that that's come up before. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the words motivation and helping people with their motivations, and there was talk of goal setting. Um, how do how do either of you go about including? or do you go about including those things within your coaching to try and um, either help people with the goal setting or um, uh, how do you help promote that within your session? I think the, the question regarding motivations, Matt, um, Paul and I have talked a little this evening about the kind of discussions and interactions we have with our students at the start of a session and throughout, throughout the time that we're with them. Um, sometimes students are... are uh, find, find it find it relatively straightforward to share those motivations and sometimes it's a slightly more prolonged process before we, we get a mutual understanding um, but we, we talked a little bit about that earlier regarding goal setting um, again it's 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 a skill isn't it and some people have first-hand experience of setting goals for themselves that help them get to a desired outcome uh, and outside of my working life, I've done that in a particular adventure sport. I, I recognized I had strong motivations to achieve something in a, in a sport that I have a great deal of uh, passion for. And I uh, knew enough about goal setting through my coaching life to be able to be my own coach to an extent. But of course, not everybody... Not, not everybody necessarily has that experience, or if they do, they don't necessarily make the connection into that particular game that they're playing. Um, so I, I've increasingly tried to link it to the stuff I do within sessions. Because if I'm having an interaction with a student and we're, we're figuring out what positive changes we can make in order to, uh, to move their performance on in a particular way, well, it's a form of goal setting, isn't it? They are incremental, measurable changes that um, can be discussed and agreed. They're done in the moment. Uh, they, they, they meet an awful lot of the, 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 the goal setting parameters that, that we could describe as a long-term process. And what I try to do is, is uh, review the way in which we made progress within a session, find some goal setting um, examples within there and then say hey we can do this on a day-to-day -day basis in our own time the next step is to consider what that looks like over a longer period of time so I've been I've been quite enjoying Matt finding ways to link what happens within the session to stuff that might be useful to the students when I'm not around over a longer period of time often with things like motivation success breeds more motivation so if we start with an easy task and make those tasks get slightly harder, then people maintain motivation. Whereas if we start with a really hard task straight away, they'll just go, oh, I can't do that. You know, I'll, I'll take Nick over to Burbage South and we'll go and have a look at Goliath. Yeah, and off with the 4, 5, C, and he'll just look at the bottom and go, I can't do that. Yeah, and it will just put him off straight away. Whereas if we'd gone and started and gone you know let's do let's do heather wall at frogget yeah it's severe 3c it'll it'll pootle up that it's nice and slabby but there might be one move that he can do a little jam in if he wants to he'll be happy with that and then if i took him on that little journey and took him on to a next route and etc he'll slowly get happier at it and then maybe it might, it might take years but we then come back and stand under goliath he goes huh actually yeah i'll give this a crack so we've moved it up so one of the things that we can talk about in terms of designing tasks and activities is this concept called game sense it's about it's it's good computer game design if you think back to your levels games that you used to play as kids potentially they don't start with the hardest level because what would happen yeah all that happens is you just go no nah, it's too hard you'll have one or two goes and you'll just switch off to it 
it starts with an easy task that you get some success with. It might just be running along, collecting some coins and jumping one gap. You've got to the end. Brilliant. Progress saved. The next level, you've got two gaps. But instead of having to go back right to the start where you'll get bored, you can start at that point again and, and move forwards. Yeah, until it progresses and progresses and progresses. Then you get to something like a, an end of level scene, whatever it happens to be. And you try some of those skills and different combinations that you've learned getting up to that end, to that end of level. And then when you right, find the right combo, you, you, you finish the level and you go on to the next level. The next level is more complex, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. If we can do that with what we're doing, designing tasks and activities in coaching, we keep motivation up and we actually manage to extend our clients a lot further, probably quicker overall, without necessarily making it too, too, too taxing on them, too stressful. You know, um, I talk to clients about when's the best time to learn to tie a figure of eight knot. It's probably why we're sat in a office or a classroom. It's really quiet. Perhaps if they're adults, we're sat in a bar and having a beer the night before. It's like, hey, guys, you're going to need to use this tomorrow. Hey, have a go with this. It's not been at the top of the abseil on Castle Hell and about to ab in to do a lighthouse arrest and go, guys, you need to learn how to do this knot before we go down there because all they can see is they're 100 meters above the sea and they're already scared because they're going to have to abseil down you know so it's about getting that right so if you think about environment and task if we turn the task all the way up and make it really really hard for them and turn the environment that they're operating in up really really high we're just going to get point blank refusals they're just not going to engage and their motivation is going to be right down in the pan it's going to be like why have i employed this person to do this conversely if the task is too easy and the environment is too easy they're going to get bored very quickly which is where our skills as coaches of reading people and that observation which we talked about earlier means we can move people on quicker and faster and by starting with easy concepts in an environment that i tend to use the word predictable and that's predictable for the client i.e. they don't think they're going to fall over in the big eddy by four mile bridge, but they know they're going to fall over if they're in the flow. The flow is unpredictable for them. The eddy line's unpredictable for them, but the eddy is predictable. We can do tasks in the predictable environment that allow them to develop concepts, to develop ideas. So we could sit there and we can go, well, in a minute, we're going to want them to cross the flow. Or in a bit later on today, we're going to cross the flow. But let's do some real basic edging tasks here in the eddy. They can see it's predictable. They can see there's no waves going to knock them over. They achieve success. And then all we do is we move them closer and closer to the flow, continuing doing the same task potentially. And all that does is that builds a competency as we change the environment. We could go the other way. We can make the task harder in that predictable environment. And that could be increasing the amount of edge we use, for instance, until they get to their natural balance point or beyond it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not beyond it too soon because that might put them off. But then what we might find is we're actually, by making the task harder, but keeping the environment predictable, we're actually probably refining the technique or the method of doing and holding an edge. So if we're thinking about shifting our weight, you know, actually, how long can you shift your weight and sit it over one bum cheek while you're in your sea kayak or your, or your white water kayak? Well, actually, I found the point I can sit on for a long, long time. Brilliant. That's refined that technique of how we're going to hold that. Once we've got refined technique and we've built competency, and if we, we don't want to do both at the same time, because that will blow it out of the water, that will make it go wrong. But once we've got that, we can then start to go, well, actually, Let's use that edge to cross the flow at this point. Let's use it at this point. Let's use it at this point, going left and right, and we start to transfer skills. Then we can go on our little sea journey or whatever it happens to be, and we can go, well, this is just like Four Mile Bridge. Oh, yeah, so it is. Brilliant. Yeah, I can see that. What did you do in order to do X? A uh, little bit of weight on my bum cheek. Did I need a lot? Mm, no, not really. Cool. Okay, let's do it. 
because they've identified it's predictable because they, they they've already been in that environment or a similar environment and all we're doing is just going somewhere else with it yeah we're we're helping them to attune to it at a quicker rate aren't we and then it makes everything yeah. transferable and adaptable which is you know they're, they're kind of big important words i know nick and i always use those words and from, the, from what you're saying you're of the same kind of mindset that we are to, you know in relation to those things how much how much importance do you place paul on the um the environment that you choose to do your coaching in or the venue selection that you you choose it's it's important depending on what the clients want what their needs are where we're going with them you know it it i'm not going to use the same place just because it's convenient i'm i'm i'm, I'm willing to drive 50 miles further if we need to you know if the clients are as well of course but you know it's it's trying to find the right place for what they need at that moment in time sometimes especially with white water kayaking in the uk we are a bit stuck and it is the d and the Twaren and there's nothing else because it's the summer yeah unless we want to go to the far north of scotland um but yeah we we really need to select it appropriately to their needs and not just because it's convenient for us so for for nick you know obviously it's convenient to use the tide races on anglesey for him but that might not be the best thing for the clients so he's going to do the drive over to london london or he's going to go further down the coast because it's appropriate for the client's needs yeah, I'm getting some nods from Nick, so that's obviously obviously the case there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you, um, when we when we started this discussion this evening, um, you were referencing um, the importance of um, breadth of experience and the the range of uh, the variety of, of encounters that people have within their within their their chosen sport. Um, and I think Matt, you you talked about. Um, the difference between routine expert and adaptive expertise. Um, it's really important to me to, to make sure that my clients aren't getting uh, too narrow uh, a, a range of experiences because that, that depth of experience can be helpful, but we need the breadth as well, given the open environments in which all these activities take place. So there are days when I uh, recognize the value and the need even for us to go somewhere a little less familiar where the conditions develop in a slightly different way and perhaps even just the scenery is different and the way in which we access the uh, the water changes a little um thankfully in my part of the uk with sea kayaking we're, we're a bit spoiled for choice so it's it's uh it's it's a, it's a fun and easy, easy decision sometimes yeah absolutely i i i and that comes down to the experience of us as coaches as well you know, uh, some of the research that I've done with decision making, um, Lowell, Lowell helped me out with a model that's going to be published in Horizons for the Institute of Outdoor Learning in the autumn in their magazine. Uh, I've been using it on coach education courses and leadership courses for, for probably about four or five years now. You know, the component factors of, you know, the clients, what their ability levels are, the environmental factors, the actual physical constraints of the locations that we're using, but then also us as a coach. And what we've seen is those with limited experiences and understanding have less things in there that they take into account in their decision-making. Whereas the more experienced have lots of things that they take into account and can very quickly go, I'm not going to consider that today Pfft, out. I'm going to consider that today. Yep. Yeah, okay. And they can, they can prioritize what those decision-makings are. Now the model that we've been using with that is it, it forms a, a pyramid effectively a triangular based pyramid and if you've got not a lot of experience it's really narrow so you can imagine that you've got a really narrow pyramid or you've got a really wide based pyramid from the, that coach with having loads of experience one is more stable than the other yeah the narrow one limited environments they've worked in limited experiences themselves limited amount of work they've done with different ranges of clients means they could probably do the job that they need to do maybe in a routine expertise way you know they're only going to operate in the lagoons at Limpadan. Um, but as soon as you ask them to go anywhere else they're thrown they can't operate they can't cope and that again is down to that experience of how we adapt as coaches and so what I was talking about in environment and task means not only for the clients that we're working with, we also have to do that as coaches. 
in order to become much more adaptive in our expertise. It's um, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite interesting when you look at the different things that they, they've they've come up with or haven't come up with. Some of them are really quite obvious a lot of the times that they're missing. Yeah, and 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 it's 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 transferable across. Um, you know, if we take it out of the coaching context and we put it into a leading or guiding um, context, it's the same. Or a group of people going out who are just peer paddling. It's these are all the same sort of things, aren't they? That um, if if we if we take them into account and we're working on them, then it's going to probably make for a better, maybe safer, maybe more enjoyable or more productive um, experience when we're out on the water, on the rock, on the hill, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting, isn't it? I think Nick says it a lot, but you know, decision-making is, is it's at the heart of everything that we're doing. Isn't it really? It's like, it's, it's one of the number one things. Um, and if we get, I've spent the day to day doing doing um, doing some leader training, and, and it's the word that kept coming up. It's about making making appropriate decisions, and we're talking about the the input stuff that's coming in, and people's awareness, and those sort of things that are going to lead to that appropriate decisions, which then they can do something with. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a subject that I think will come up numerous times on these podcasts um because it's something that that we really enjoy and i think most people who are out there um engaging in adventure sports if they don't think about decision making well i think they should start putting a bit of time and, and effort into into doing those things great paul we've had um a couple of questions from our um, essential members so i've got i've got one here um which comes from craig and craig would like to know if you have any tips for practice or task design to help him with how to generate those things first off you've got to think about what is the skill that needs developing once you've identified that so that's through the observation through the questioning all those sort of things that we've talked about um either mentally or if you're doing this as a pre-planned exercise having already seen them so maybe the following day for a second day of a course uh, think about what all the components are of that skill. So list them, write them down, every single one, every single component. Before you start thinking about matching those needs to the client, think about a couple of options for each of those components on how you're going to teach them. An easy, easy way of doing it, a harder way of doing it, a harder still way of doing it. So it's coming up with giving you options. Once you've got those options you need to prioritize the order or the components that you need to do with that particular client or that group of clients so you can then go and match their needs specifically so for instance let's think about the component parts of uh, we mentioned it before rock over you know there's component parts there's identifying there's a rock over yeah or well, they need to use one there's the initiation that could be from pulling or pushing depending on the environment that we're in we've got shifting that center of mass so potentially you're getting your nose over your toes to to get that mass over in the right direction um then once you've got momentum going you've got to be able to kill the momentum so straight away that gives us a whole host of different components within that now if we've got some tasks that allow us to work on each of those components we can then prioritize the needs of the client. So if the client can already see they've got a rock over, but they don't know how to, they're missing a part, well, we can take it back to a floor-based exercise as an easy part, or we can then turn it into a, a, a wall-based one and then we can progress it on. So it gives us lots of options for planning. It also means that when you're doing it and the client gets through it quickly, you've already got the next task in that little progression because perhaps potentially they still haven't got that whole concept of getting their nose over their toes, for instance. So they've done it stepping onto a step and they can get it, but they can't transfer that onto the wall. So we've now got another task for them to do it onto a wall. We've then got another task where they're having to do it slightly higher, for instance, and it involves needing much more momentum to start with potentially. So it allows you to be adaptive because you've actually already planned it. Yeah, we used to talk about um, with the trainee teachers or trainee trainee to coach educators actually, is I actually remind them what it was like to have a trainee teacher in their classroom when they were students. 
and they always go, oh, yeah, we gave them a real hard time and their lessons were rubbish and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, great. You know, that you know that poor teacher probably spent two and a half hours, three hours planning that one hour lesson that you destroyed because you didn't give them a chance because they were trying it out because they're new to it. Guess what? The clients are going to do that to you. And it's going to take you time to plan a good lesson or a good session. And you won't get it right. But by having things planned in that what happens if they do things quicker, you've already got some progressions to go to instead of trying to make it up on the fly. I um, I can echo all of that, Paul, because I've had the same conversations over this weekend and um, we've talked about the idea of well, the differences, I should say, between making a lesson plan and having session ideas that are there and, and the use of that, those different progressions is something that that um, I know we all we all talk about, and I I say if we if we've got this idea and we we understand that these all these different things, well, it's making life a bit easier for us. It's giving us some some shortcuts in some way, but it's also helping sometimes with with our pitch. If we go in with a a deliberate plan that we're we're going with this and we're starting here and we're finishing here, well, if we've made it too difficult we've got a problem. If we've made it too easy, we've got a problem because straight away we're deviating from a plan. Whereas if we've got a, a continuum, a spectrum, whatever you want to call it, well then we can, we can go in at a point and if things aren't quite there, well we can easily go back or we can go forward and we've got freedom, haven't we, to move along that rather than being fixed to a set area. Um, so yeah, I mean, someone mentioned it before about having that, that understanding and that's one of the big things that we need to have isn't it we need to have an understanding of what it is that we're doing and um, one it it helps the client but also it helps us as well it, it makes life a bit easier for us if we're constantly having yeah. to do things for the first time and imagine it for the first time and 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 try it for the first time that's all right for one or two occasions in a day but for an entire day which is often what we end up doing um, with our groups, we're out for an entire day with them. That's that's a lot of work on our part. And at the end, we go yeah. away. You know, your heart, your head's going to be a bit fizzed out, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I find that something like a foundation coach course for me, I'm quite used to delivering it. So actually, I'm not that tired at the end of the day. But something like a a, a development coach training course or a rock climbing development instructor course, I come back from the end of every day absolutely knackered because I've got to stay one step ahead of them. I've got to get the syllabus criteria through you know understandably but also they're all coming at a slightly different angle so they're asking all these technical questions or they're going but what what how, how do i going to teach this every single one of those courses that i deliver is different you know it's not the same it adapts and i'm, I'm pretty certain it'd be the same for you guys you, you know there'll be some similarities so if i watched one course you know next week of one of you guys and then watched another course of the same type a year later i'm going to see similarities but it's not going to be the same because we've had to adapt it to the clients but also we've learned from our previous deliveries and also our ongoing delivery has been outdoor professionals ourselves great all right what a what a great way to end the podcast um Paul, I'm 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 going to bring us to a close. I don't want to because I'm really I'm really enjoying this uh, this 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 conversation tonight. Um, but I am aware that that time's time's creeping on. Um, I, I feel like there's lots that we've not touched on, and we we seem to say this at the end of most of our most of our recordings. It would be great to do a, a part two or or to get you on again. Um, and that's not just something that we're saying because sounds nice it's it's really something that we mean so um maybe we can create an opportunity hopefully we can create an opportunity um to come and and, and get something like this going again on a different subject or yeah. a continuation of, of what we're doing already um so thanks a lot for your time tonight and your contributions they've been, been really it's been really high quality so um i'm excited to to get it out there so thanks again for your time paul Thank you, Paul. It's been a very stimulating discussion. I'm sure it's going to be a great podcast. So uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Not a problem at all. Thank you, guys. If you've enjoyed the show, why not take a look at our Essential Members program? For only £3.60 a month, you get exclusive access to a huge range of videos, articles and webinars covering technical skills, leadership principles and coaching issues from the world of power sports 
with many topics easily transferred to other adventure sports. We think it's amazing value, so come and check it out. Remember, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Until next time, have fun and stay safe.